only on two. KPRC 2's Gage Golding is sitting down with the Executive Vice President of Regulatory Services and Government Affairs at Centerpoint. Gage? Yeah, hey guys, good afternoon. I'm joined by Jason Ryan here, Executive Vice President here at Centerpoint Energy. Thank you so much. I know you're incredibly busy, you and your entire team. And on behalf of Houston, we thank you for all the hard work the men and women here at Centerpoint are doing. First and foremost, how are you and your team? Is everybody okay and safe? Uh, we are, and you know, I want to start out by uh, thanking our customers for their patience. Uh, we're about 48 hours since the hurricane left the greater Houston area. Uh, and our team has performed well. We've had no serious injuries or fatalities. Uh, very proud of that, especially with the more than 10,000 additional resources that we brought in from other utilities. They're not used to being in Houston. Uh, they're working in dangerous conditions. And so uh, the men and women in the field are safe and super proud of that. And that's a, a staggering number. So let's start there. Um, I met I think it was a crew as far away from Wheeling, West Virginia, sure. that I, whenever I was out, and I worked in Wheeling, West Virginia many moons ago, and I was just so shocked that they were here so quickly. And I believe the number was 12,000 people out working to restore power. Have you ever had an activation of that size before, or is this kind of of historic proportions, if you will? So we've never had this many customers out from a storm before. Uh, 2.26 million customers out at the height of the storm. Uh, so as a result of that unprecedented outage number, we needed to have an unprecedented response. So we brought those crews in as soon as it was safe to bring them into Houston uh, and got them to work. There are more than 11,000 uh, people working on the system today. 11,000 today? Yes. So uh, let's talk about that. That was a, an incredible goal of a million people right. restored by the end of today. Are you confident that, are we gonna reach that? Yes, we're on track to reach that. Uh, we uh, restored 918,000 customers uh, as of one o'clock today. So we're on track to hit that million uh, customer mark. Our crews are working 16 hour days uh, and we're gonna work nonstop around the clock until we get all of our customers back on, but we are confident in hitting uh, our goal for today. So one of the, uh, we put an article up earlier asking our KPRC2 insiders to you know, give us some questions that they want to ask you if they could be in sure. the, the hot seat with sure. you right now. One of the questions was, is, and we saw some crews you know, just in a parking lot. There's crews down the street from me. They're in a parking lot. They're not working. What are they doing? Um, is that a shift waiting to go on? You know, what are these? How does that all work? It could be a number of things. It could be them documenting the work that they've done so far. Uh, it could get, be them getting additional um, directions for the work that they need to do. You know, so some of these crews, they get on site uh, based on the assessment that they've done, uh, that we've done. Uh, they may need additional information uh, before they can get started working. Again, 10,000 plus of these uh, personnel are not Centerpoint Energy employees. They need to understand the standards uh, to which we have to build our system. They need to understand how high the clearances for the lines need to be to comply with local ordinances. So they they may be getting that additional information before they start their work, or they may be uh, recording the work that's been done to date so that we can get those outage numbers constantly updated. You know, uh, so there are a number of reasons why they may be uh, idle for a minute. They may also be on break. We know our customers are hot. The men and women uh, doing this work are hot. So they are, are taking breaks. They are rehydrating. Um, so that may be another reason why you see uh, the crews not actively working, but they are out there working. What are some of the biggest problems that you're dealing with right now? Is it, you know, like what we saw during the May storm with transmission lines down? Is it vegetation? What yeah, are some of the yeah. biggest obstacles out there? Yeah, so unlike uh, that storm, unlike uh, Harvey before it, uh, this is not a, a storm that caused material problems on our transmission system. The transmission system are the big poles and wires that move power across the state. Uh, we didn't have material damage to the transmission system. We didn't have material damage to our substations. Our substations didn't flood uh, like they did during Harvey. This is a distribution system challenge. It is the, the poles and the wires that go from the substations to your home or business. That's the distribution system. And it's largely debris on that distribution system. It could be entire trees uh, that have fallen over. Uh, it could be limbs that have fallen over. Yeah, you know, we've gone through significant freezes, significant drought, significant rain, uh, unprecedented uh, extreme weather conditions on our large trees here in Houston. You've got large canopies without mature root systems. And so that's why you see entire trees coming over onto our infrastructure. So it is a vegetation tree 
problem on the distribution system. Our personnel, as at the end of the day yesterday, had walked 4,500 miles of distribution lines to assess the problem so that they can assign the right crews to do the right work. You know, if we, uh, we have to, before we can send the right crews out, we need to know, do we need to send a construction crew out, a large construction crew to rebuild the poles and the wires? Do we need to send a vegetation crew out to remove trees? Or do we need to send a smaller crew out uh, to rework smaller parts of the distribution system? You know, knowing which crews to send out is the reason why we do that assessment work in the first 48 hours. And we, we talked about the, I brought it up, the derecho back in May. Uh, that put quite a strain. Actually, believe it or not, June 7th is when we did that interview. Fast forward a right, month right. to the day is whenever Barrel was That's about right. to make landfall. So just very ironic. That's right. And, you know, we talked back then about how during Ike, Centerpoint had 12 days to That's right. get, you know, ready to brace for it. And to Rachel, you had no time. 15 minutes, yeah. How much time did you, you know, realize that, yeah. okay, this is gonna, this is gonna impact us and our customers? Yep. Yeah. So we started watching this storm nine days out. And as everybody knows, uh, at that time, it wasn't looking like it was coming to Texas. Obviously, as the days got closer uh, to uh, Monday, that started to change. It really started to change over the weekend uh, when it was more clear that it was going to hit the Houston area. So we uh, lined up 3,000 uh, mutual aid resources to come into Houston before the weekend. Uh, as it became more clear that this storm was going to have a direct hit on us, that's when we increased the number of people that we asked for, and that's where the uh, greater than 10,000 crews uh, came into play when it was clear that the storm was going to hit right here. And one of the things that we talked about in depth that there's already a change from the derecho to now was the outage tracker. And That's I, right. I want to quote our interview that we had. You said, we didn't meet customer expectations when that wasn't available, when they needed it most. It's not acceptable to us or our customers. And this is what really stuck yes. with me. Yes. We know that we will not have that grace from our customers and communities to miss it again. That's right. The new outage tracker, you, you promised a new outage tracker right. and maybe a little bit quicker That's than right. you would have wanted to try That's it right. out. Are you happy with the new outage tracker, and is this is this the solution to make sure people are informed? So the, the outage tracker map that we put up uh, last night is still a temporary fix uh, that shows uh, kind of in groups where you are in our restoration process. We will update that map three times a day at noon, 12 noon, at 4 p.m., 8 p.m. We will update it three times a day. Starting tomorrow, we will have estimated restoration times uh, that's more granular than what you see there today. That is still a temporary fix. We are starting completely from scratch with a new outage map uh, that we unfortunately uh, were aiming for the end of this month in advance of the typical hurricane, uh, peak of hurricane season, right, August, September. Uh, but we are bringing a completely new uh, outage tracker map that will be able to withstand the significant traffic that we saw during the derecho. Uh, it was that significant traffic on the map that brought that site down. We knew if we put that same site back up, it would not meet customer expectations this go around either. Uh, so that's why we came up with the outage map that we put out yesterday. Uh, we will continue to refine the information on that map uh, and provide estimated restoration times starting tomorrow. Another thing we talked about back in June, and it seems like such a long time ago, but in the world of you know, business, it really isn't. We talked about the supplies, because right. our concern back then was how, does, how did that derecho affect hurricane season that's when right. you have all your stock built up? And I remember you telling me that, you know, you said, I can't lie to you, I, I, yeah. we're trying to get everything put back together. Yeah. Were you able to replenish your stock in time, or are you facing any supply chain issues or we need more poles and we can't get them type of a deal? Yeah, we don't have any material challenges uh, with our supply right now. We did uh, replenish that over the, uh, the course of the last month plus uh, since the derecho. So we are not having supply issues causing delays in restoration. If I have no power, I yep. see my neighbors still have it. Um, I think there's a lot of people, I, the number one mm -hmm. question I get is, you know, when is, you know, 77098 coming right, from? When right, it's right. like a zip code or something like that. Right. What can you tell people yep. uh, that are, and I get it, I don't have power either at home right now. It was a very uncomfortable right. sleep last Same. night. Yeah, so you don't have power either? That's right, that's right. So it, even even that one of the top dogs right. doesn't have that's power. Right. So you're, you're with us, you know, and I'm sure you're wondering, when is that 
that right. beautiful white truck going to come rolling right. down and fix my stuff. Um, what could you offer to the, the CenterPoint customers and people of Houston to just help us get through this? To, you know, what we dig for any information, what would you offer them? Yep. So uh, we know that customers want to understand the process. So yesterday we put out uh, a visual of the process. It's a five-step process, right? It starts with our preparation. Post-storm, it starts with assessment. That's step two of the process. Many of our customers are still in step two, but a number of our customers have, have gone on to step three, which is restoration at the circuit level. Think of uh, circuits being uh, the main highways of the distribution system that bring on entire um, areas of town. Right, And so we start working on circuits first and with the theory of bring on the most people the quickest and you'll get to the uh, onesie twosies later. Right, We know that's still frustrating for those uh, one or two people that are out in that neighborhood, uh, but our priority is to get the most people on the soonest. So as soon as we finish those circuit level outages, that's where you might see certain neighborhoods on, but other neighborhoods not on. Again, we work down uh, the priority list. So uh, step three are those circuit level uh, outages. Step four starts getting into the neighborhood specific outage. And then step five is the premise specific outage. Uh, during Hurricane Ike, for example, I was the last house in the neighborhood to get on because the line to my house was on the ground. Uh, nobody else had the line on the ground. And so I was one of the last ones because that's the process that we use. And everybody wants to have the priority status. Right. Even you don't have the priority status. Is there, is there a priority leveling? Is there certain neighborhoods get power first because of you know, status or anything like that? Or is it right. based off of where the hospitals are? Right. So uh, we do give priority to a number of public safety uh, related uh, premises. So think water treatment facilities, 911 centers, right? So we do prioritize getting those facilities back up um, while at the same time we're working on the circuit level outages that for the homes uh, and businesses. So we do prioritize those public safety necessary uh, premises to get back up uh, before you get into boil water notices unnecessarily, things like that, right? So we don't want the problems to get bigger just because uh, you might be the onesie twosie, but you're an incredibly important public safety um, premise. So we do prioritize those. We are working through those priority lists as we speak. And we only have a couple minutes left. I want to get across two more things here. The last time we talked in June, you said Ike cost about $700 million and the derecho in May was around roughly at the time, I'm sure it's changed a little bit, but about $100 million. Is there any forecast on what this has already cost or what it will cost? Uh, not yet, right? We're still in the first 48 hours of the event, but we have brought in many more crews than we brought in um, for the derecho. So this will be, you know, a multitude or, uh, you know, twice as much probably as the derecho event, but we're still working on that. And uh, we talked about this in depth in June, and we reported on it, and I think this is a, a really interesting thing, the resiliency plan. That's right. And uh, a an huge, monumental investment by Centerpoint to make the grid stronger. And uh, a lot of the questions that people had uh, was actually answered by that is, you know, yeah. why, why aren't they investing in, you know, and they as Centerpoint, investing yeah. in making the, the grid and everything stronger. That's actually in the process of happening. Can you That's explain right. how and what the resilience plan is and how that's going to help if we knock on wood, hopefully we don't get right. one of these again, but right. if it happens, how it will help prevent having these monumental numbers? Yeah, so our resilience plan that we filed with the state back in March has 28 different programs associated with it. Some of them are on hard infrastructure like distribution lines where we're replacing uh, wooden poles with harder composite poles. Uh, some of them are cybersecurity related, some of them are physical security related. But let me stick with the, the pole example. And we've seen during the derecho, we've seen during this storm where we've already started putting those composite poles up. Uh, in these severe weather events, those composite poles remain standing. Uh, and right next to them, wooden poles that we haven't yet replaced are on the ground snapped in half. So we know from these early uh, tests that the resilience plan will yield better results uh, once it's fully implemented. 
Well, Jason, Ryan, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate you, you taking the time. We appreciate all the work that Center uh, Centerpoint is doing. And, you know, look, uh, a lot of people still in Houston without power. It's going to take time. But 12,000 people? That's right. That's a lot of people that are out there working right now. Uh, so we'll have more on this coming up in the coming hours, uh, but we'll send it back to you for now. Yeah, a lot of numbers to talk about, Gage, including the 1.3 million customers still without pow uh, power right now. And we know their frustration is palpable as we continue on in the middle of a heat advisory mm. as well. But we appreciate Centerpoint sitting down with us this afternoon.